Okay, everybody, I just want to thank you so much for joining today's town hall on um, waste issues and recycling. Um, we always call it recycling, but it is going to go through the whole reduce, reuse, recycle, um, all of the things that we want to accomplish. So I really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, I put some info in the chat that we're really excited to hear your input and we're hosting this series to hear what matters most from you about um, the issues that we're working on. This event's gonna be structured in three parts. Um, what, where we're at um, with policy, research, funding, et cetera, and what our advocacy on this issue has achieved as well as some state of the state in what we've already accomplished. Um, all attendees are muted by default, please stay on mute. Um, once we get to the public comment period, we can use the raise hand function to call on you. Um, or for those joining my phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand um, and we will call on you. Um, if you're using the video option, please be mindful of what's around you. But we really do want to get your feedback today. Um, it's really important to me to hear more um, about what you want to see us work on with these. So feel free at any time to write anything in the chat box. And Daniel is leading the way here with asking if the session covers composting and we are going to talk about composting. Um, and so uh, you are in the right place and you should feel free to um, add your feedback at any time during this or ask questions during any time. Even if we don't get to it, we will have it in the notes. And I, with that, want to um, move this over to the person who is in charge today, um, which is Paloma Campillo, who is our communications associate and um, just hired to IEC and is going to be running today's town hall. And also want to thank our summer intern, Ellie Burnham, for um, taking some notes during this. So, I will pass it off to Paloma to introduce our speakers and go through our agenda. Okay. Uh, Jen, actually, I'm going to need you to make me a host again real quick because I cannot share my screen. Uh, Jen? Hello. Oh, yep, I got you right here. There you go. Okay, awesome. Your co hosts and ready to go. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so our agenda we have a lot of really awesome speakers that are going to um, talk about a bunch of different parts of the whole waste reduction process. So we've got Marta Keen, who's going to be speaking on behalf of the Illinois Product Stewardship Council, Kay McKean, who's going to be talking on behalf of Scarce, James Jennings, who's, who's talking to us from IEPA, Stephanie Kataros, who's from Chicago Sustainability Task Force and the Wasted Food Action Alliance. And then we're closing it off with Jennifer Jarland, who's going to be talking from the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. Then I'm going to do a little brief talk about where IEC is at with this, and we're going to go into public comments we should take the majority of this session. So with that, I want to hand it off to Marta Keen, who is going to be talking to us about product stewardship and circular economies. Uh, Marta? Yeah. Uh, Marta, you're muted. I'm trying. <laughs> unmute. I'm not unmuted. There you go. You're good. We can hear you now. All right. I was trying to share this. <laughs> uh, so thanks for having me. I hope we haven't started my timer yet. Um, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see if I get this up. All right. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. I am wearing two hats today. I'm actually wearing uh, my past president, current board member of Illinois Recycling Association hat. And this is not moving for me. Here we go. All right. And I wanted to talk first and foremost, the Illinois Recycling Association is concentrated on our traditional recyclables. Um, but we also have folks who are involved in recycling a lot more things. And I have some notes on here that anyone that would like to look at this presentation afterwards and see is welcome to um, in the interest of time. I just wanted to say that 
there is a list that the state uh, helped develop of all the things that are taken statewide. And we try to get the education out there about that. And then there are a few items that are taken certain areas, but not everywhere. Uh, and so you wanna check with your local county, your local city and find that information out. And there are some reasons, including why they get, they get marketed, uh, why they can't take some of these items everywhere. Uh, China, China did have a huge impact on us a few years ago when they stopped taking a lot of materials. And uh, we created the Illinois Contamination Task Force in 2018 to help address that. A lot of the folks that are here today are on that. Uh, and one of the things that we have found with that, what is contamination? We try to drill down on that. People will put in their containers with food and beverages still in them. That can be a source of contamination and cause problems. They'll also try to recycle items that are recyclable, but the fact is they can't be recycled in your curbside program like plastic bags. And then there's the thing we call wish cycling, which is, oh, this looks like it could be recycled. It's plastic, it's metal, they can do something with this and they absolutely cannot and no one is recycling that item. So, so those are all forms of contamination and they cause problems at our material recovery facilities. I just wanna mention again, Illinois Recycling Association has been around for about 40 years. So all the challenges we're talking about with traditional recyclables, please know that we have members that actually recycle a lot of other different kinds of materials and they also all face their own challenges. Electronics faces some serious challenges with plastics thanks to China um, and our construction and demolition folks are facing challenges right now and the IRA is gonna be having a panel discussion in August regarding some of that. Uh, there, of course, was the additional challenge that everybody faced with COVID. And again, I have some notes on here. Feel free to come back and look at them uh, after the fact. But the nice thing to take away is that our material recovery facilities guys were already in PPE. There was some minor adjustments that had to be made. Recyclables do not contain enough COVID to infect anybody. And, and there was a surplus of workers because nobody could go anywhere on vacation. So they didn't take vacation time and not that many people thankfully got ill. So we didn't have to stop collecting a lot of materials during uh, the height of the COVID phases. So uh, moving forward, uh, the challenges are that China's still not taking a lot of our materials. And there is strain on the government, not just from COVID, but lots of different issues. And we are seeing recycling uh, programs, municipal recycling programs that are actually being taken away from people, not only in other places of the world, but also right here in Illinois. East Peoria, I just found out this morning, uh, they have a one year moratorium, no more recycling curbside in East Peoria. So this is something that we're gonna see more and more of as the price of recycling goes up and becomes competitive with the cost of landfilling. People are gonna make economic decisions rather than environmental choices. And, and we need to be aware of that. So how can we fix that? Well, here's the thing with a nice circular approach is the manufacturers make these materials. The manufacturers can also be held responsible for collecting some of these materials and doing something positive with them at the end. So the other hat and the main reason I was invited to speak uh, is that I'm chair of the Illinois Product Stewardship Council. We are a member of the Product Stewardship Institute, a national organization. And they have been around for at least 20 years doing various stewardship legislation uh, in many, many states, as you can see from this map. Uh, just so you're aware, the difference between extended producer responsibility, where a manufacturer by law is mandated to take back something at the end of its life, and product stewardship is product stewardship has the goal of actually working with manufacturers at the design level, making sure that they take things and they make them from sustainable sources, maybe use recycled content in them, there's a thought. Okay, and also that they're recyclable at the end of their lifespan. So designing from okay. the very get go. Okay, <laughs> this is great. This is super informative, but we are at five minutes. So if you could start wrapping up, that would be great. Okay, so when they're involved, you see a huge return. And again, Canada's outperforming us with 78% uh, recovery rate. We have 119 laws in 33 states plus Washington DC um, with uh, product stewardship and EPR. 
We have a concentration in Illinois, of course, on electronics, if you think about that one. Um, but also we do mercury thermostats. We're, work, we're working on paint. And thanks to IEC, we're also working on medications this year and hope to see that passed. Um, it provides sustainable financing, which of course we've addressed as an issue, creates jobs, better environmental footprint. And um, just so you're aware, this is going to be my contact information. Should you have questions after this and would like to find out more about how using EPR and product stewardship can actually be a solution for the recycling issues that we're facing. Amazing. Okay. So next we are going to have Kay McKean from Scarce talking to us a little bit about what happens after this. So Kay, do you want to take a, do you want to take the lead now? Sure. Hi everybody. Getting our PowerPoint up here. I've got my tech support. Thank goodness. So SCARES is, uh, we'll start our 30th year next month, which is quite amazing. We're a not-for-profit. We're based in DuPage County, and we are grateful for the funding we receive from DuPage County for some of our education programs. Today, we're really talking about reuse um, and all the forms that it can take. And so thinking about the idea of the benefits of reuse, fewer items, of course, going to the landfill, not wasting the iron ore, the coal, those resources that these things came from, less pollution, less energy used, no packaging when you're reusing, and then of course you save money, uh, less expensive. Lending libraries are one of the really new fun things that we're seeing. Libraries have always been great for us in lending out books and then DVDs and those kinds of things. But now we actually have libraries that are lending out tools. Maybe you don't always want to have a waffle, iron but you can borrow a waffle iron from some of our libraries now you don't have to buy it you don't have the packaging it's free you return it um, more and more libraries are adding this uh, elmhurst library has an unbelievable reuse it area of their library so it's a great way to start thinking of reuse rather than buying something we've always had rental agencies for tents and things but these are more things like puzzles and sewing machines a really great uh, addition to borrowing Maintaining and repairing things, you know, buy a good enough purse and then get the straps replaced when it's time to get it replaced. Buy a used purse and then get it re uh, repaired when you need to, and your shoes. Finding a really good um, alterations person in your own town is a great way to get things. Maintain them, buy, buy something really good, maintain it, and then get it repaired. Creative reuse, of course, finding a reuse for something that you um, need to find a new way to use it. Uh, instead of it going into a landfill, I, I really love the ski chair out of old skis, but there are very creative people and more and more of that is online, Etsy and so forth. Our center here at Scares, we take books, uh, lots of school supplies. So teachers have chosen over eight and a half million books. You may have books at home that you have not looked at in years. You may have books that somebody gave you that you never even opened. Kids books, coffee table books, textbooks, storybooks, novels. Um, these are the ways to help our, our schools that are need more supplies or supplemental materials for their students who at home don't even have books. Art supplies, you can see the paper rolls here from the companies that make copy paper, the end rolls then they donate for art teachers and things like that. So everything from scissors to books um, and all kinds of containers and short bookcases for teachers for use. You can see from this picture uh, chairs crayons, band uniforms, band instruments, skeletons. We had an agency that closed and we got three skeletons. Those are $1,200. So that's a really good find for a school that needs a skeleton. Many options are increasing every day, I think, about how to uh, reuse, buy things that are reused. Thread Up is a great organization for clothes and families can make a little bit of money sending in things that are good. They sort them by brand. You'll see more and more, and I think now with Neiman Marcus saying they're going to be selling uh, reused clothes, I think it's really going to just zoom. We've seen all kinds of numbers, $70,000 increase in the reused clothing market, so that's pretty exciting. Um, the secondhand mall, this is in Sweden. I wish we had these here all over Illinois, all over the country. Um, I don't know how to pronounce Retuna, but that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, in Sweden, but this is just an entire reused store. Everything in there has been reused or repurposed. Pretty exciting. A whole mall of it. Office furniture. We have been getting lots and lots of office furniture. When we talk about the virus, business is downsizing, business is closing, and of course, not-for-profits can come in and get 
um, tables and chairs and file cabinets. We mostly do it by pictures so that um, agencies that need supplies, furniture and stuff can see the picture. And then we just hook them up. We network them so it doesn't go to a landfill and those not-for-profits get a benefit. Medical supplies, we probably get calls almost every day about wheelchairs, walkers, hospital beds, and people are already pretty distraught when they have some of this equipment in their place. So this is a wonderful way. This is a whole list of agencies that need, uh, have lending closets, loan closets, nurses closets at churches, and ways to help these agencies help their patients. The ReStore, there are many of them here in Illinois. What a great place for tools and appliances. And then help, the second benefit, of course, is helping Habitat for Humanity. Guitars for Veterans, there's 100 locations across the country. Uh, maybe you wanted to be Elvis, but you're not. And so we've got guitars and these high school kids take gift cards and make them into guitar picks. And we donate those to Guitars for Vets. So kind of two reuses, less garbage and help our veterans as well. The Working Bikes Organization, of course, for bike parts and tire pumps and helmets and bike baskets and bike tools to repair bikes. Uh, they do a fabulous Once job again, in so Kay. many ways. This is the last we one, here we go. This is it, awesome. textile <laughs> recycling with Goodwill. Um, DuPage County, I know Kane County is working with the Rewearable Organization. Uh, we have five locations here in DuPage County for things to get recycled or reused. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much, Kay. Okay, next up, we have James Jennings from IEPA. All right, thank you for having me. I don't think I will ever be able to compete with Kay's uh, speed there, but I will see how this goes. <laughs> um, so I, I manage IEPA's waste reduction and compliance section, and uh, we have a lot of um, exciting things that we're going to be uh, pushing over the next uh, year and a half, um, much of which, though, is tied to waste reduction, as you'd expect. Um, the, uh, historically, most of the material that goes to landfills has an alternative outlet. And it's ultimately incumbent upon our group and uh, the stakeholders with whom we work to find ways to get as much of that circle uh, to somewhere other than a landfill as possible, recognizing that in Illinois, we have a shade less than two decades of landfill life expectancy left, and at which time we will have serious problems. And so it's, we have to find a way to extend that as long as possible. Um, COVID uh, certainly has not helped that. Uh, I know Marta did an excellent job covering the issues, but I mean, as you see here, collections have narrowed, uh, there's new contaminants, there's been limitations. And so this inherently informs um, what was already going to be a um, very exciting exercise for our group over the next year. Um, so how, we've repurposed how we're evaluating our work from just trying to ensure waste reduction to effectively um, use this as an opportunity to be a hard reset on the policy positions that our group helps uh, enforce and follow because of the need to minimize the amount of material that goes to landfills. And we have a couple of very effective tools um, that were already in the works that are, have really enabled us to speed this process along. Um, in developing these tools, though, uh, we've tried to maintain um, as much faith as we can in our group's operational commitment, and that's to support uh, local collections with now an enhanced focus on environmental justice impacts. One of the things that we've noticed as part of taking a deeper dive into the uh, historic information in the state is that there are massive collection deserts and the overlap between those collection opportunity deserts and areas that are disproportionately impacted um, by uh, economic and other factors um, is significant, and we want to do everything that we can to help address that as an organization. Um, we're continuing our education and partnership opportunities with other outside groups, um, recognizing that uh, they've been effective in the past. We want to use those as a springboard to um, facilitate a uh, plan that the General Assembly has passed us with pulling together. Um, last summer, the General Assembly passed a bill that task the agency with uh, initiating a statewide materials management uh, advisory committee. The committee is, gonna, is um, assigned a, an exciting but also daunting task of developing a, effectively a plan for how waste management, recycling, and materials management will be handled in the state for the next 15 years. Among the objectives are diversion goals. 
and those goals ultimately inform everything that we are going to be doing as part of the group. Um, the slides are going to be available, and you can see the individual elements here, but the thing that is probably the most important to relate, particularly to this audience, is that as a public body, the meetings for this committee are open to the public. Um, the agendas will be posted on our website. Uh, we've had some things that go a little slower because of remote work, um, but we have monthly meetings of the group as well as all the subcommittees. So I would encourage people to avail themselves of that opportunity because while the task force is comprised of 25 uh, professionals from a wide variety of backgrounds, we certainly don't monopolize the expertise in the state. And we would welcome any type of meaningful comment because ultimately, while we are the group that are uh, authoring this plan, it's a plan that will have will impact each of you all. And consequently, we want your investment as well. Um, the inward facing item that we're working on uh, is our statewide organic action plan. Um, this is something that's going to ultimately weave into the work of the Materials Management Advisory Committee and predated that bill. But uh, we're undertaking um, what we believe is an ambitious but realistic objective of working to reduce food waste in Illinois by 50% in the next 10 years. Um, that's congruent with the um, previous federal administration's um, objectives, which uh, were science-based and we feel are uh, workable within the state. Um, we've done a lot of work already to try to get things started. COVID certainly hasn't helped that because it's impaired our ability to make connections on the outside because of um, other parties' understandable um, competing interests at this point. But uh, this is something that our team is continuing to work on, and we've been fortunate that um, we've been able to add some staff over the past year that have particular expertise in this area, particularly on the infrastructure side. Um, that we feel is going to make this plan a reality uh, within the next few years. Um, so uh, for the audience here. Uh, um, James, just letting you know that is five minutes. So if you're around, right, that's well, awesome. That's perfect. This is my last slide. So we want to hear from you all. So these plans aren't effective without public input. Um, so the our committee meetings are public meetings. Feel, you should feel free to attend, stay involved. Um, and then on the outside, uh, continue to demand these services. The more that we can integrate this type of conversation into the state's materials management DNA, the harder it is to retract. And so um, be active, be uh, loud, and feel free to reach out if there's anything that our group can do to help. And there's my contact info, so feel free, and uh, I will turn it over to whoever's next. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. Next, we have Stephanie Katsaros, who is speaking on behalf of Chicago Sustainability Task Force and Waste Food Action Alliance today. I should be unmuted and you should see my screen. Are both of those things happening? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, as I said, I'm having a little difficulty. I can't see what you see, but. Um, all right, so I'm starting the clock. There we go. All right. Uh, the Chicago Sustainability Task Force is a large uh, facility operators, event organizers, and program coordinators that take action to improve operational sustainability and environmental awareness. And we all collaborate to positively influence and strengthen local infrastructure. Initiated with an EPA grant back in 2008-2009, um, we've continued forth in its voluntary participation. Um, the members span the public and private sector, Cook County Environmental and Sustainability, and the Forest Preserve, Chicago Public Schools, Department of Aviation, Park District, universities, museums, hospitals, nonprofits and businesses, including United Airlines, Live Nation, Goose Island, Revolution, Brewing. I'm saying these names because it's kind of maybe hard to see the commonalities, but we all share common challenges when it comes, oops, when it comes to waste diversion and it's um, bringing that to scale. So uh, in 2015, we published a set of guidelines, basically recommendations based on our collective policies and procedures to address operations, specifically, you know, material management, um, contract language with vendors and contractors because you can't count on assumptions and requests. Um, a desire to recycle doesn't mean as much if you're not clearly explaining what you expect people to do to get it to the right place 
in your own facility, but but influencing the system and the infrastructure is the key to broader change and really what will only, only what is necessary to bring success. We can divert, or I should say we can sort materials, but if they're not getting to their final destination as we anticipate, it's not successful. So um, I'm kind of going, sneaking into the next slide. I've got super generic slides, but the point is just to really clarify um, our challenges and kind of what strategies as large scale operators were, uh, were using to combat them. Reuse. You know, there's not a real organized network around that. We don't have Kay living in our backyard to help us. And also there's storage and collaboration and coordination. That's, this has been a hit or miss thing in Chicago. We hope this can come back and even be broader um, statewide. Single use packaging. This is a challenge beyond plastics. In order to align a decision on purchasing single use, you have to know the infrastructure. You have to identify what the facilities consider a contaminant um, in the recycling stream or the compost stream. But we're challenged by transparency from reporters or from reporting, if it's a hauler or a processor, as well as the infrastructure itself, which is the challenge to those very individuals. Um, we can talk more about what we're what we're doing to combat that but policy and enforcement is another challenge because you know a lot of public entities are a part of uh, CSTF and holding the public entities accountable is necessary for their proper management and declarations and commitments of uh, of what you're doing it is important to put pressure on the very organizations that our group works within um, also, uh, I'm not going to go on. So um, then the last thing is actions to improve equity and access. You know, education and communication is valuable. Um, getting uh, Chicago public schools and city colleges to do more education and outreach. We've got a lot of efforts working with nonprofits and advocacy groups on plastics and watershed pollution. Also, knowing incentivized incent incentives are so important you know, pay as you throw or concepts like this, we'd love to see. In my last minute, I wanna talk about the Wasted Food Action Alliance, which is a diverse set of statewide organizations building a unified approach towards reducing wasted food, lever leveraging it to benefit the region and collaborating to combat uh, wasted food by creating solutions. And that includes, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about the problems. I, I'm gonna assume this group knows what the problems are, but the solutions include promoting and connecting waste food prevention, rescue and recycling services and programs together, and then actively supporting schools and institutions to reduce waste and to expand food reduction education and activities. And lastly, to develop and support policy that would um, really support and incentivize prevention, rescue and recycling. Um, so I'm thinking about everyone who's listening, how we can all influence our policymakers and talk to our leaders. And if there's leaders on the line, how can you help address these needs and desires of large organizations that the ones I mentioned on Chicago Sustainability Task Force and all the individuals that make up all the stakeholders of Wasted Food Action Alliance and beyond? Five minutes, eight seconds. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. Very well timed. <laughs> okay, uh, so then closing us off, last but not least, is going to be Jennifer Jarland from the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. All right, thank you. I'm just getting my slides up here. And full screen. Start at the beginning. Very good place to start. Hi, everybody. I am uh, by day job. My, I'm at Kane County as the recycling coordinator, but I'm also the chairman of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. So I'm wanting to talk about that last piece of the garbage pie, the food scraps that we're finding in the landfill. And uh, after, of course, the hierarchy of getting wasted food to people who can eat it, um, and then maybe to animals, um, in the hierarchy, composting is one of the solutions before landfilling. Um, the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is an organization made up of individuals, community and government organizations, businesses, schools, institutions, all of the haulers, the processors of compost throughout the state. And 
The areas for food scrap programs include commercial composting, which are businesses and restaurants, usually having it hauled commercially to a facility, institutional composting, schools, hospitals, jails, etc. also usually commercial hauling. Residential composting includes backyard on-site composting and uh, curbside collection as well. The programs um, that the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition has uh, been involved with are the We Compost Program, which is a voluntary recognition program for restaurants or anywhere that's serving food to people. Uh, and this is a program that uh, if you are composting your food scraps in the kitchen side, the pre-prep food scraps, and then uh, post-consumer food scraps as well, there's different levels of We Compost partnership. Uh, huge list of partners there. That's a great program. Have a look out for that. The logo is there on this slide. Uh, also, see the IllinoisCompost.org website, which is the IFSC website for info on how to get programs started in institutions or at home. Um, ton of information there. Currently, there are over 50 residential curbside food scrap collection programs in Illinois. Uh, growing by the year, they are added to more and more municipal contracts. Uh, most of these programs are in the greater Chicago region, but there are some others. St. Louis Compost has quite a few. Uh, there's, so there's another epicenter down there. Uh, definitely potential for more. A lot of the residential programs are what we call ride-along programs because the food scraps can ride along in the yard waste cart that is already there or the yard waste program if it's bags that's already there that's already being picked up by a truck so you don't need to add a truck uh, that can go to a destination that accepts both yard waste and food scraps so it can be added into programs quite easily uh, just takes a little bit of planning if you are interested in helping your municipality make that happen, there is this fantastic guide and it's hot here in my slide, the Residential Food Scrap Composting Guide. It's for local officials and community leaders. It's a guide that answers questions about how, how to do this, um, descriptions on the different types of programs, resources, case studies. So there's a, a ton of information there for you to access. Uh, another big part of what the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition does is to work on infrastructure and markets and how and planning to uh, foster more food scrap composting in the state. So here's a link to the compost facilities map and that's for facilities that process organic materials, both yard waste and food scraps. Currently, there's not a huge percentage that do take food scrap because of uh, the problems in processing it, but we that is one of the things that we do hope to foster, so bear that in mind. Uh, we, we want more and more of them to be able to accept food scraps. The Compost Market Development Committee, which is one of our six subcommittees of the IFSC, uh, really focuses on networking with haulers, processors, um, and potential markets, ultimately broadening the end market for the finished compost. And here's a, a link to their report if you're interested in the work they're doing. Also, a link to the annual reports by IFSC and a link to the strategic plan. The categories that are in our strategic plan include advocacy programs, market development, and outreach. Some opportunities, um, thinking about this as a town hall and an opportunity to have discussion. Um, we want to advocate for reestablishment of a state grant funded program for market development and food scrap related sectors, uh, money. Always money is an issue, but really to help try to build the infrastructure, um, we need some grant funds. Uh, please utilize and share as many, the many resources that are on the website, have a look. It's, there's so much stuff on there. And also you can join IFSC as a member and uh, there are opportunities for individuals to join, organizations, uh, there are higher level partnerships as well that really sustain the work that we're doing. And please do follow the IFSC. There's our website, our blog, and all of our social media handles. And, and again, just a final uh, thank you to all of our current sustaining partners that really make the work that we're doing possible. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Okay. Now, before we get into public comments, I'm just going to very briefly go over a little bit of where IEC is at with waste reduction. So if you guys will all just bear with me for a couple more minutes, I'm about to, if that's 
Okay. So like what everybody else has been talking about so far, IEC's waste reduction work is largely focused on avoiding waste production at various points in the production and consumption cycles. Specifically in the past year, we focus on reducing plastic waste at the point of creation. At the state level, we backed a bring your own container bill and in the city of Chicago, we helped to introduce a plastics ordinance, both of which are aimed at reducing the amount of single use plastics that make their way to consumers and thus have the opportunity to become waste. And all of that is definitely super necessary, super important work. But what I'm mostly going to be talking about here is some of the things that we don't really incorporate enough into our work in waste reduction at IEC. So that brings us to equity and racial justice. Historically, IEC has not really centered equity or racial justice in our waste reduction efforts. However, that is something that we are trying to change. So to open up that discussion, I'm going to bring up a, uh, an effort that IEC is currently working on where an equity and waste reduction intersect. So IEC is currently working with affiliate organizations and community members in the city of Chicago to oppose a scrap metal recycler called General Iron from moving from the, Chica from sh the Chicago neighborhood of Lincoln Park, which is one of the city's most affluent, to the southeast side, which is predominantly Latinx, lower income, and already has a higher concentration of air pollution. So this is a waste reduction equity issue because metal recyclers are known polluters and facilities like General Iron tend to be, tend to be disproportionately located near lower income areas and communities of color. So this means that we not only need to be thinking about the ways that we, re that we recycle as individuals, but the ways that facilities recycle and how those, have, how those impact communities that are in close proximity to them. So now I just wanna give a little bit of background on General Iron and why it is that we are opposing them. So to do that, I've laid out a brief timeline of some of their environmental violations. To name a few, they've had multiple fires and explosions. They've been cited by the United States EPA and they've been forced to shut down by the city of Chicago twice. The most recent shutdown was May of this year and shortly following that, they were granted an air permit that would enable them to relocate from, that would allow them to relocate to the Southeast side and remove the last structural barrier for that move. However, this does not mean that opposition is dead. We still oppose this move. So do some of our affiliates and so do many folks on the ground. And if you are watching this right now and you happen to be a resident of the city of Chicago who also opposes this move, then you can write a letter to this email address that I've included here and let Chicago's mayor know that General Iron does not belong on the north side, the south side, or any side of the city. And yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that to show a place, specifically equity and waste reduction, where IEC does have a bit of a blind spot. And it is without a doubt not the only one. So with that, I want to open us up to public comment so we can hear from you all other places where we should be paying more attention and other things we should be prioritizing and in general, what our waste reduction agenda should look like in the future. So if you'd like to make a public comment, uh, could you please just put uh, your name in the, into the chat and I'll make a stack. Also, if you'd like to make a public comment, but you don't want to talk on Zoom, that is also totally okay to do that. Either just type your comment and put it in the chat, or I will also put my email address in the chat and all of you should feel free to reach out to me with any comments. So yeah. I'll just give you all a second to go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, so while we're waiting for comments, we did have a few questions that already have shown up in the chat. So I can go ahead and start opening up with those to just kind of get things moving, or actually, let's see. Oh yes, uh, someone asked about presentations. We're gonna be sending out um, a copy of the, uh, of the whole recording of this. So we can also send out the everybody's presentation links and all of that. Okay. Okay. Um, we have one question from Kay Ahouse who asks, are there sustainability programs in Madison County and downstate areas? I think James might be suited to discuss the way that recycling is uh, throughout the state. Yeah, so there, um, 
particularly downstate, uh, sustainability is a county to county driven um, exercise. And in some cases, it's um, personality driven as much as anything else based on individual staffing. Uh, Madison County does have some sustainability uh, initiatives that are ongoing. Um, their uh, planning and development department, um, in conjunction with St. Clair counties as well, um, is pretty active in pushing local collections um, and providing base, uh, kind of one day events to help supplement some of the existing curbside services that they ha that are already ongoing. Um, the much of their portfolio, though, um, at least from where our group has interacted with them, um, is probably a little bit of more of the traditional type of materials um, that would be part of a materials management program. So they have medication collections, household hazardous waste, um, and some composting, but it's not um, developed to the same degree as what you may, might see in Chicago or the um, collar counties. Um, that being said, I mean, the staff that they have right now are really engaged um, and have, uh, when we've had conversations, expressed a lot of interest in growing to um, be more congruent with um, what's available in other areas of the state, uh, which has been, from my understanding, a resource issue as much as anything else. Thank you, James. Okay, uh, another question that we've got or actually, um, I received some questions ahead of time from Jennifer Futterman, who, if you'd like to um, actually say your questions, uh, could you raise your hand? Otherwise, um, I can just read them out. Or, can oh, you, perfect. Uh, can you read them? Because I yeah, don't for have sure. that email in front of me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I just remembered that. So Thank you. Okay. Your first question was, can statewide composting regulations, including specific guidelines about composting, compostable packaging be created to reduce contamination and improve education efforts. This is especially critical now given the um, amount of extra time, uh, amount of extra takeout waste happening during the pandemic. Um, I'm happy to take that one as well, at least to kind of provide the IEPA perspective, um, unless I'm, uh, maybe Jen Jarland, if you'd wanted to chime in from the IS ISSC perspective first, I'm definitely good with that as well. Go ahead, James. Okay, so um, the Space composting rigs have not been revisited um, since the mid 1990s. Um, that's not to say that there haven't been evaluations done on them, but the last time the Pollution Control Board took action on the rigs was in 1996. Um, so, consequently, the science behind that supports those um, vastly outpaces what's currently on the books. Um, one element of the agency's organic action plan is to modernize the composting regulations. Um, we are uh, developmentally um, behind all of our Midwestern counterparts in that uh, respect right now. Um, the contaminant, like with recycling, I mean, composting contamination is a significant statewide problem. And because this is an, a forum that is regulated at the state level, we have, there would be the um, the forum to be able to include something like that as part of a regulatory proposal. Um, we're hoping to start doing outreach on the on our concepts for reworking the composting rigs at some point a little bit later this summer or early in the fall um, because because of the um, evident need to revisit what that looks like. And so um, how we look at this is that that's an opportunity to entirely revisit what's included in the structure of that. And so um, education and initiatives to minimize the amount of contamination uh, would certainly need to be included um, in order to help encourage uh, the growth of some of the end markets that would otherwise suffer from failure to include that type of um, regulatory structure. Right, and I, I would add that uh, we have discussed this as a board, obviously, bans. Uh, Gary Cunin of Seven Generations Ahead is 
uh, always, you know, bringing to our attention the bans that are happening in other states, and and we talk about how how could this, uh, what would this look like in Illinois? It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, of course, but really, um, it's there needs to be more infrastructure before we could in in you know enact a ban uh, so that we have somewhere to take it, and so you know, with the residential programs growing, that's going to create a need. Also, um, as mentioned, contamination is going to be an issue. So there's a lot of work to be done there and, and figure out, uh, you know, the tiers that you would do in a van where commercial would be first so with so many employees. And those are easier to control the con contamination. You also get the larger volume of feedstock. So we are talking about it and looking uh, forward towards that future. And I'd like to Thanks, guys. I'd like to quickly add to Jenny's question as it relates to the um, compostable plastics and the compostable serveware. You know, there's just, there's not a lot of consistency and transparency in regards to the way in which those are processed. I see you shaking your head. I know we um, are speaking the same language. And so the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is taking on an effort to bring together some of the processors and the makers of the serveware, as well as the certifying bodies, you know, BPI, um, an organization called Compost Manufacturing Alliance, um, to bring everyone together to just talk about what the realities are. Um, and so that's August 20th is when we're doing that um, webinar forum. And we do hope to see a bigger thing happen. This is a nationwide problem. So as far as you're speaking on the on the serveware and the, the compostable um, packaging, that's that's just a new update. All right, thank you all. Um, we do have a few other questions following that same um, composting vein from Jenny. Uh, the next one would be: Could carbon farming sequestr slash sequestration, sorry, I've just butchered that word, <laughs> be utilized in organic waste processing slash disposal. I, I do not have any expertise in that area. Uh, I, I hesitate to comment. I, I mean, um, it's, I just have seen it here and there. I know there's one place in Marin County that's doing it. I think Susan from Seven Generations shared that with me at one point. And, you know, it's just an idea to you know, maybe grow more recs or give people incentive to, to do that. Or if there's a way to combine it in solar fields or, you know, it's, if there's nowhere else for it to go, maybe there's somewhere else you can put this compost that no one's buying right away. So. That, that question might be a little far down the road. <laughs> yeah, and like, I definitely think that, um, you know, natural solutions and their connection to carbon sequestration is gonna be important. There's a little bit of work being done on, um, you know, anaerobic digestion counts as part of the renewable portfolio standards. Um, and I know there's some work to maybe see how we can carve more of that out. So um, that's an interesting question. That's probably related. My next question was kind of about the biodigesters and things like that. So I think it all ties in and it might be farther down the road. <laughs> yeah, but it's good to know for our prioritization just and, and for other questions for folks, you know, feel free to just also give us a statement. But I think you're giving us that we should look a little more at carbon sequestration and um, also at uh, uh, anaerobic digestion and its role in, in climate. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, next to just kind of get through a few more of these questions, I'm going to go to one from Gary Tanin. He asks, what research and analysis has been done recently on the viability of a phase ban on organic materials in landfills? Is this being considered as part of the waste diversion plan? So, um, as Jen John noted earlier, uh, I think that there are some natural concerns about a lot of types of bands absent um, the infrastructure to absorb materials that would otherwise be going to landfills. Um, certainly, the ob our objective is to minimize the amount of material that would have to go go that direction. But um, 
a organic waste ban may not necessarily be palatable on today. Um, there's been some research done on the viability, and a lot of it, a lot of the recommendations do ultimately come back to concerns over infrastructure. That being said, um, the state of Vermont's uh, food scrap ban went into effect two weeks ago statewide, and um, they it, they will have provide sort of the model to illustrate how a statewide ban on such a prevalent material stream. Um, can actually be implemented and implemented effectively. The, uh, I have a close working relationship with their program manager, and uh, she's very optimistic that it's going to lead to not only very um, incredibly positive things for the state of Vermont, but sort of a sea change nationally after the positive illustration that this is something that can work. So um, there has been some research. There's, a, like I said, a real life example playing out. Um, today um, in New England, um, but in Illinois, I'm not sure that we have the infrastructure today to necessarily have that conversation, um, because, just because of some of the uh, on-the-ground realities, particularly in the central and southern parts of the state. If I can just make a comment as a public comment, not as an expert, but, um, you know, James is is bringing up a great point and the whole thing is infrastructure but you know is would the state our counties our cities considering the education on backyard composting you know the the awareness around that opportunity so that we can take organics out of a landfill in smaller space you know as individual as our backyards as as small as community gardens you know how much are we doing to what would you say decentralize this problem as well as working on infrastructure? You know, is it, isn't that something we can, we can think about in policy recommendations? And, and, and I think of it because I know Vermont, you know, you've got a big backyard, you can compost over in that acre over there. You know, we don't have that opportunity in Illinois, but not all of us, but maybe we do have enough space for small systems. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. And, um, it really gets to the need for um, us collectively to build that type of diversionary activity just into our day-to-day -day lives. When we've done some um, sort of generic uh, public discussions on um, that a type of broader landscape waste, or not landscape waste, uh, organic waste diversion, um, it, in certain areas of the states, there are, uh, we've had uh, responses that have been that they just don't particularly like the um, exercise of having to sort things out in multiple ways. Um, it's not difficult. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the more that we can do to um, promote the activity on your own, I mean, I, we compost in our backyard and it's no different than what you would do anything else. And now our kids view that as just part of their day-to-day -day activity. The more that we can promote that where it becomes part of your human pattern, um, be more likely it would seem that we'd be able to have a more ambitious statewide um, type of ban that would be palatable for the um, society, for society as a whole. So you guys, this is Kay from Scarce, and I agree we need a lot more education about backyard composting, but we also have schools doing outdoor backyard composting, and I'm really excited about that. We have several churches as well. We have several small businesses that have enough property and they're composting their food scraps right on site. I think it's a very exciting um, time for food scrap composting to compost it in your backyard. I think people are partly doing it to help keep the nutrients in their own yard, to keep the water in their own yard, a way to water, you know, to conserve water because compost holds more water. I think there's a lot of reasons people are doing more backyard composting and it does save them money as well. So that never hurts. Um, but we've, we've even got a hospital that's been talking to us about composting food scraps right on their own property. It's a smaller hospital, but that's a pretty exciting thing. And I think education is always the key. One of the things that we have here in Illinois is the uh, pumpkin smash project that we do with the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. And that has educated so many people and it's gotten so many kids and schools, um, organizations, park districts excited that food scrap composting isn't that difficult. I think there's some myths out there about how hard it is or things like that. So the, the Pumpkin Smash project has really um, ignited a lot of interest and a lot of education. 
to get more people composting and to say, so now where does that pumpkin go and what's it going to become? And it's kind of a natural process that they're learning in a fun way and they're learning no contaminants, no candles, no plastic ears and no stickers and things. So it's a fun way to educate a lot of people at one time. Thank you all. Okay, got one more question that I think is probably best for Marta. Okay, uh, are biogas systems being considered as part of the closed loop system? And if current biogas systems are flared off, can they be updated to produce usable fuel? That one is once again from Jenny. Well, uh, speaking as Will County, I can tell you that we have a methane gas recovery facility at our landfill. Um, I don't know if that's quite fitting the bill, but certainly we are turning uh, some of the methane gas from a landfill into electricity right now, powering about 3,000 homes. And our county board is currently looking at uh, that we have more than enough methane gas that we want to do something uh, different. We don't want to just add more generators. We actually want to invest and uh, do uh, turning that into compressed natural gas. And so that's actually the project that we're looking at right now um, for any for any active landfills. Uh, this this can be a really great way to take care of your methane gas instead of just flaring it off and wasting that resource. Um, now that said, the yeah, other side of that is that um, you know when you take the organics out of the landfill, then you won't have as much methane gas. So once we get to that point, which you know we're not there yet then that will reduce the amount of gas coming off the landfill. I don't think that should stop these projects, but obviously you have to look at the economics of the projects when those things happen. So uh, I think that yes, it is part of a circular economy. Uh, I also would like to add to, um, to that, that our own Joliet Junior College, which is uh, quite well known for creating some great chefs uh, in their kitchen, uh, in their training program, they have added a composting, uh, well, sort of dewatering machine to take in uh, not all of the food waste, uh, food scraps, excuse me, food scraps that are actually, <laughs> saw you there, Kay. <laughs> um, but not, not all of the, not all, like they can't do the bones, but they are doing almost all the other food scraps that come out of their kitchens for cooking and making sure that that is not going to the landfill. So we are big proponents of that. Uh, and I do think that's all part of the circular economy. All right. It looks like most of the questions we have addressed now. Oh, uh, we got one last one from Jenny was, are there grants available for waste haulers to improve their MRF technology efficiency and what they can accept for recycling? So right, there are um, grants available at the federal level. Right now at the state level, um, we, don't, we haven't opened our grant making window yet uh, in part because we're still sorting what exactly the budget fallout for some of our funds would be from COVID-19. Um, however, uh, we, the agency has the authority to issue grants and we um, have internally developed the documents that we would need to be able to process those. So once we, once we get clearance on our funding levels, uh, there, we would have that opportunity um, at the state level. Thank you, James. Uh, I guess I will put out a last call for any more questions if anybody else wants to ask anything. Hi, this is Susan from Seven Generations Ahead. Are there any updates on the Illinois bills regarding um, the beverage container deposit and, and other single use plastics initiatives?
Okay, I think wanted to make one comment before we had it out. Paloma. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? That's okay, you want me to close it out? Gonna talk. So my, my comment wasn't about that question. Does somebody okay. want to ask a question? So everybody, we just want to thank you so much for coming. We're going to take a lot of what was in the chat and um, have some notes and a memo follow up and like do some preparation both for the work we're doing at the city and the work that we'll do in the state in 2021. Um, feel free to continue to stay in touch, especially with Paloma, um, to make sure that we have any feedback or comments that you would want us to work on. Um, but we really appreciate this. This is very helpful and um, please um, continue to stay in touch. So thank you so much to our presenters. Um, they were wonderful. Um, and uh, we just really um, appreciate you and your involvement and, um, you know, stay in touch. So, and there's Paloma's email. Um, thank you uh, so much for joining us and we'll um, share the taping later. So thanks everyone. I think our last, we have one on transportation next week and we have one final one on conservation. I think it's the 23rd and the 28th are the final two town halls. So hope you can participate. So. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.